Hey guys, this is Mr. Mahmood, and you're watching Defense Lecture 1. Uh, this unit goes over all the different ways that your body protects you from all of the potentially hazardous and harmful uh, things that are out there that could very well cause you damage. And for all of you uh, medical science people out there, anyone who has any sort of interest in pursuing something in medicine in the future, we're all my future doctors and nurses and uh, chemists and biologists out there, anyone who's ever wondered why their body reacts to certain things the way that it does is going to love this unit and this again is a perfect example of how what you're learning in the classroom really applies to absolutely everything around you uh, every day you involve yourself and you expose yourself to things that could definitely cause potential harm to you but you don't even realize it most of the time because of how amazing your defense system is so we'll get into all of that here over the course of the next few lectures but at this point we're really going to start with the basics about understanding what some of these different microbes are whether we're talking about potentially hazardous ones or potentially helpful ones that happen and occur all throughout our ecosystem. So we'll first get into a basic understanding of the helpful microbes, talking about different categories of microbes, specifically bacteria, fungi, and protists. Then we'll get into some of the harmful examples of microbes. So again, there'll be harmful examples of bacteria, protists, and fungi. But you'll notice that we're talking about microbes and only referring to those three categories. We're not going to refer to viruses until we get away from the word microbe, and we'll talk about why in a little bit. We'll talk a little bit about an introduction of viruses, let you know a little bit about how it works, and start getting into the idea of how it's able to actually function and the cycle that it goes through in terms of its replication, what we call the lytic cycle. And then finally, we're going to end on antibiotics, which we should have just finished talking about at the end of this previous unit. You guys did a lab in relation to antibiotics. You talked about it in relation to natural selection. So we'll first now really get into what antibiotics are and how they apply to how your body is able to protect itself uh, and how antibiotics can be used to help your body protect itself through certain types of infections, not all infections. So we'll talk about all of that here as well. So let's go ahead and get started. The first thing we're going to talk about are different categories of what we consider to be helpful microbes. Now the key thing I want you to pull from this is I know a lot of you when you hear the word bacteria you probably automatically think of negative things. You probably automatically think of harmful bacteria Think of diseases, think of infections, think of things like that. When in reality, there are many, many examples of microbes, whether it be bacteria or some other microbial organisms that are essential for our survival and that we as the human race have really learned to utilize for a number of different purposes. So first, let's talk about ways that we have actually learned to use types of bacteria and types of microbes to actually help our own diet. There are multiple food examples of things that require microorganisms in order to be able to make it for us. Yogurt's a good example. Cheese is a good example. Any dairy product you've ever had, the milk alone included, is full, full of bacteria. Uh, so when we talk about making and culturing things from milk, all you're really doing is allowing bacteria to break down the milk itself and begin the process of actually solidifying that milk. Basically anytime you've heard of bad milk, if you let milk sit out for a while, the curdling and the collection and solid particles that start to form, all of that's because bacteria is going through a process to break it down. And as bad as that may be for just the plain milk when you're trying to drink it, it's something that the human race has actually learned to utilize and, and learn from and use to actually make other food sources. So that sour taste that comes from yogurt is nothing but the waste product being made by bacteria. That waste product is called lactic acid. That lactic acid that's a buildup of fermentation is what gives yogurt its solidified structure and it gives it a lot of that flavor. That is also the first basic step to making any kind of cheese. You have to first let bacteria convert the lactose in the milk into lactic acid, and then you can go through a process of adding some different types of enzymes, uh, and then pretty much make any kind of cheese you want. Basically, you change the initial animal that you're getting the milk from, or how long it takes in any one of the steps in the process of cultivating the cheese, and you get every different type of cheese uh, across the world. It all starts with milk and bacteria. So bacteria plays a very important role in the fermentation and the process of making a lot of the foods that you eat. Uh, breads are another perfect example of how we utilize microbes fermentation process to actually make food for us. In this case, most of the time, instead of using bacteria, we're using fungus, particularly yeast. 
yeast is actually a unicellular fungus that we'll learn about a little bit in the next unit as well. Fungus is important for a number of different reasons. Here, we as humans have learned to use fungus and the yeast especially to help us produce all different categories of bread. And all of our bread products originate and start with basic yeast that we allow to go through its own fermentation process. Another way that we have learned to really utilize the power of fungus, and, and really this is probably the most important medical breakthrough that's happened in the last couple of hundred years, is by utilizing its ability to help break down other types of microbes. And it's all because of this guy. This guy's name is Alexander Fleming. This guy is probably the luckiest scientist that's ever been around because this guy accidentally discovered penicillin. This guy accidentally discovered the medication that would save millions of lives in the early to mid-1900s and is still being used today. Basically, he's super messy. And if you, he's a lot like me. If you've ever seen my desk, you know we're both messy people, but we have a system, right? His system wasn't so great at cleaning up a lot of the cultures that he was doing tests with. He was a scientist and he did a lot of cultures, and he was growing a lot of different things on those cultures. One of those cultures he was growing happened to be a type of bacteria, but he didn't do a great job of avoiding contamination on the culture, and he actually got a little bit of mold on the same culture. And he wasn't really thinking too much about it, kind of left it off to the side and was worried about some other things. And when he went back to that culture, he found out that the area where the mold was growing didn't actually have any bacteria on it at all. The mold itself was actually keeping the bacteria from being able to grow in that same area. So that was a huge breakthrough. That was the first time that, that scientists had been able to found any way to really slow down bacterial infections because uh, with all the different world wars and things that were going on there, there were a lot of infections that got very bad and could cause very, very serious harm, possible amputations, or definitely even up to the fatal levels and cause death. So this was a huge discovery and we'll talk about penicillin and the role it plays in a lot of our understanding of modern medicine and the problems that come with the overexposure of that penicillin as well. We'll get to that later. But this is just another example of how microbes can be helpful. In this case, a lot of the antibiotics that you use, a lot of medications, are based off of basic fungi and funguses that are made and different molds that are made that serve purposes for the human body. So another very important use of fungi. There's another natural use of fungi that is occurring within all ecosystems as well as very many kinds of bacteria. Bacteria and fungi are usually the two examples of organisms that we think of as decomposers. A decomposer is an organism within an ecosystem that helps break down organic matter into its most basic components so that those components can be recycled through the ecosystem and can be reused again. Very important components, things like carbon, things like nitrogen, are all broken down by very particular categories of either bacteria and or fungus. So again, microbes play very important roles to help the ecosystem and help the world around us. This is a perfect example of that as well. So the microbes that play a role of decomposers are critical within the ecosystem. But really the number one example and probably the most direct to you within your human body of microorganisms that can protect you and help you the most are the ones that we talk about in a subject that is probably not the most politically correct but we talk about our poop. Okay, let's talk about poop a little bit here. Your poop, as you can imagine, is the waste product of your digestive system, right? You take in your food, you break it down into all of its basic components, or as many as you possibly can. Those basic components get absorbed out into your bloodstream through your small intestine, and then sent out to the rest of your body. Everything else is pretty much compacted, water is absorbed out, and then whatever is left gets released out, and that's your poop, right? Most of what you notice within your digestive system in terms of helping breaking down your food is actually bacteria. You have millions of bacteria all throughout your digestive system that actually help you break down your food. They play the role of taking a lot of your food components and feeding off of it. And in the process of feeding off of it, they break it apart for you. So without these types of bacteria, we wouldn't be able to digest a lot of the food that we eat. In fact, going back up to the yogurt, there, you might notice lately there have been different types of yogurts that advertise that they're probiotics, that they play uh, major roles in helping you regulate your digestive system and things like that. Uh, Activia and different types of yogurts like that. All they're really saying is that they have extra bacteria inside of them. All yogurts have bacteria, like we said. These have extra bacteria. But of course, uh, a lot of advertisers and, and marketers probably realize that saying 
buy this yogurt because it has extra bacteria in it probably didn't go too well with the focus groups initially so they said they called them probiotics instead so all this really is is just extra bacteria that goes in your digestive system but these are the bacteria that help you so you have massive populations of these helpful bacteria all within your digestive system and in fact the majority of what gets released out in that poop is bacteria it's probably the most I'll ever say poop in a five minute range but it's very critical here that you understand that there are many many types of microorganisms that are extremely helpful uh, for you and for the ecosystem so just because you hear bacteria just because you hear microbes does not automatically mean it's harmful okay so that being said there are definitely types of microbes that are disease causing so just because I'm saying there are helpful bacteria doesn't mean you should just go out and take in any kind of bacteria or microbe you've ever heard of. Obviously, there are some that aren't going to be so great for us. So there are these categories that we consider helpful. Now let's talk about what we consider harmful microbes. Um, there's a term for disease causing uh, in, in science. We call it pathogenic. So if you ever refer to anything as a pathogenic microbe or as a pathogen, that means it's disease causing. So a pathogen is something that causes disease. And then disease in turn is just any kind of damage to your body, with the exception usually of an injury. So as long as we're not talking about you breaking something, if something is being damaged in your body, then it's usually due to some kind of a disease. So if a disease is an actual microbe or disease causing agent, that would be a pathogen. So a pathogen is anything that causes disease. Now within the category of pathogenic diseases, a lot of those diseases fall into bacteria. So there are quite a few bacterial microbes or bacterial pathogens. And these are just a list of many examples. Some of the most common pathogenic bacteria will be uh, the ones that cause most of the different categories of pneumonia. Uh, pneumonia is a respiratory infection. It is not caused by a virus. Uh, it is not caused by the flu or things like that, but it's actually a bacterial infection. Um, all the different categories of food poisoning that could occur within your digestive system, uh, most commonly things like salmonella or E. coli, Escherichia coli. There are different categories of E. coli, by the way. There are disease-causing E. coli and there are helpful E. coli. In this category, we're talking about the pathogenic or the disease-causing. Uh, there are different types of infections that can occur through sexually transmitted diseases, things like chlamydia, gonorrhea. All of these are examples of bacterial infections. And, and one of the ones we're going to talk about a little bit later is a category of bacteria called Staphylococcus aureus, uh, which is a very important type that deals with the most dangerous types of staph infections. If you've ever heard of staph infections, it's staph is short for Staphylococcus aureus. So we'll talk about staph infections a little bit here as well. So there are definitely disease-causing agents that are bacterial, and we'll talk about what your body does to defend against it, not only towards the end of this lecture, but we'll be hitting that quite a bit in some of the future lectures as well. But not all pathogens are bacterial. There are other categories of harmful or pathogenic microbes as well. Uh, we haven't really talked about protists yet, I kind of skipped over them, but protists have some major roles in terms of helpful and beneficial use for the humans as well. Um, a lot of the food that we eat, the anything related to seaweed or kelp or any of that, obviously is straight from protista because those aren't plants. Seaweeds are actually examples of protists. Uh, but those same protist components, the seaweed components, are used as thickening agents in a lot of your food and things like that as well. But protists can be disease causing as well. Probably uh, the most common example of a disease causing protist is what's called the plasmodium protist, which is uh, the vector, the carrier of malaria. And it's the type of protist and type of microbe that actually causes malaria. It's carried typically by mosquitoes. You see that picture there of mosquito. If a mosquito feeds off of somebody with malaria, it takes in that plasmodium protist. It doesn't necessarily cause harm to the mosquito, but then when the mosquito feeds off of someone else, it passes that blood into um, the person they're feeding off of. And there are also examples of fungal pathogens, disease-causing funguses, typically things that are external. Good examples are things like athlete's foot, like you see here. It's a fungal infection of the foot that is can get out of control if, you, if it's not taken care of early. So there are a lot of different categories of disease-causing microbes, but you notice how when we're talking about these categories of microbes, I haven't yet used the word virus. And there's a reason for that. A microbe, by definition, is an, a microbial organism. And an organism means it's living. Now, a virus is not actually considered living. 
viruses are definitely pathogenic. There are many, many viruses out there that are disease-causing. And this, again, is just a list of a number of different viruses that are disease-causing for the human population. Some of the most common ones or the most well-known would be the ones that, in, that cause the common cold, what we call rhinoviruses, influenza that causes the flu. There are viruses for skin infections, such as the varicella zoster virus, which is actually what causes chicken pox. Uh, there's smallpox, the measles, uh, all different examples. Sexually transmitted diseases, you get into herpes and then HIV. Those are all examples of viruses, right? But I don't actually consider any of these to be living. And there's a reason for that. In order for something to be living, it actually has to have all eight characteristics of life, something we've talked about before. All of the bacterial infections, the protist infections, the athlete's foot and the fungal infections, those are all living organisms that are causing the infections because they have all eight characteristics of life. This virus, as we're going to talk about, is not something we consider living. We'll get into more about the structural components here, but basically, we'll typically split viruses into two categories, what we consider bacteriophages, which are viruses that attack bacteria. That should tell you something about the size of a virus. If a virus is small enough to get into a bacteria, then that means a virus is definitely even smaller than bacteria. So we're talking about things that are very, very small when we relate to viruses. Uh, but the one there on the right is probably the most common example of the size and structure of a virus that would typically attack the human body. So a lot of the category of viruses you see there on the left have a structure very similar to what you see there on the right, similar to, in this case, the influenza virus. And we'll talk about all the components within that here in a minute. But basically, here's what we have to understand. If we want to think of a virus as either living or non-living, we have to relate it to the eight characteristics of life. And what if I told you, out of these eight characteristics of life, the virus is only capable and only has three of the eight characteristics? These are the only ones that a virus actually does have. It does have its own universal genetic code, which we're going to learn is very, very important for how the virus is able to do what it does. It is able to maintain its own stable internal environment. It does have a pretty strong external structure, so the internal components are pretty well protected for a certain period of time. And then finally, and probably most importantly and most damaging for us, is that it absolutely does change over time, or it does evolve, which is very bad for us if we're, tr we're trying to figure out ways to be able to protect against it. Once we figure out how to protect against one, we have a whole new one to deal with because of the quick mutation rate that a lot of these viruses typically tend to have. So if I tell you that a virus only has three of the eight characteristics of life, it's for that reason that I would say viruses are not living and therefore I do not consider them microbes. They are pathogenic, they are disease causing, but they are not actually living. They're not organisms. And so the reason they're not living is because of these five components that they are not actually capable of doing on their own. And it's because they're not capable of doing these things on their own that they are desperately in need of other cells to do certain jobs for them. If you think of a virus as having a sole goal, the only goal of a virus is to replicate, is to make more of itself. That's all it's there to do. It has no function. Otherwise, it doesn't want anything positive to happen for anyone else. All it cares about is making more and more of itself. This is what we call a virus, and this is how it works. So if it really just wants to do number two of the eight characteristics of life, it can't do it by itself. So it has to utilize other cells that have the components to do it for the virus. So let's now take a look at the actual structure of a virus, and let's focus in on the influenza one there on the right to give you a basic understanding of why we consider a virus to be non-living and how it's actually able to take advantage of another cell to do the characteristics that it's not capable of doing on its own. The basic structure of a virus, as you see here, does have some similarities to a typical cell. Let's start with the inside and work our way out. One thing that it does have, which is critical for its being able to work with any other cells in our body, is its own genetic information. So it, just like all living things, is part of a universal genetic code. It has genetic information, DNA or RNA, that has all the sequence and components similar to what you would expect to find in any other cell. However, the DNA or RNA, whatever the genetic information it has, doesn't really instruct anything beyond the process of making more viruses. So all the genetic information a virus has purely is instructing how to make more viruses. It's just a basic instruction manual. It's just to make more viruses, nothing else. It's not making any other proteins. It's not doing anything to help or to further along any other cells around it. It's purely there for its own selfish benefit. 
right? So that's the genetic information. Whether it's in DNA or RNA, we'll talk about the different categories of viruses here in a minute. Then outside of it, it does have some sort of a structural component that helps to kind of serve the, uh, serve the role of protecting the DNA, except instead of thinking of this as sort of like a nucleus, I want you to think of this as a particular category of a protein coat. We call this protein coat that's found in a virus that's around this genetic information a capsid. Capsid is a very specific term only for viruses. So if you ever hear the term capsid, I want you to immediately think of that protein coat that surrounds the genetic information of a virus. So it does have this protein coat or capsid, which is again why it's able to maintain a pretty stable internal environment. And then along the outside, it does have structures similar to a cell wall. However, it's not considered a cell wall because a virus is not considered a cell, since again, it doesn't go through all eight characteristics of life. So it does have structural components similar to that. It does have an outside membrane. That outside membrane is made of what are called glycoproteins and a lot of structures that are pretty similar. And probably the most important part of the structure of a virus here, and particularly how your immune system is able to protect your body against them, are all of these little proteins that are out on the surface of this structure. You notice all these little lines and extensions uh, coming out? They are all categories of antigens, and we've talked about this before. An antigen is a surface protein, right? We talked about them a few times. There are a few different categories of antigens. We have receptor proteins, we have channel proteins, and we have marker proteins. We're going to focus in particularly on two of those three when we're referring to viruses and probably when we're referring to a lot of the pathogenic bacteria. We're going to focus in on receptor proteins and on marker proteins. And you remember the role of each one of those and think back to those because you're definitely going to have to know that as we get a, a little further along and talking about more of the detail with how your body protects it. But this structure, just like any other viruses, have specific categories of marker and receptor proteins. And it's this particular component that's going to allow a virus to do what it needs to do to invade a cell, basically trick the cell into thinking it's something that it would normally allow in, and then invade it, take it over, make it do nothing more than just become a virus factory for the rest of its life. And that's pretty much how a virus is able to get more viruses made. It can't reproduce on its own. It doesn't grow and develop on its own. It can't obtain and use materials and energy, so it can't get any energy to do anything on its own. And it can't respond to its environment. It can't react in any way, going left and right, adjusting, getting smaller, shrinking, getting larger. It can't do any of that. It just does what it does. And if it's successful, it, it makes more. If it's not, it doesn't. And over time, the ones that are successful are the ones that stay in that environment and the ones that become pretty serious problems for the hosts that they're invading. And the problem comes in the fact that once it invades a host, that cell will no longer do what it was supposed to do. And over a fairly short period of time, especially when we're talking about these types of viruses, that cell will become destroyed. That cell will burst and will never be able to function again. And that virus will then just go over and take over more cells and start the whole process over again. So once a virus is able to actually infect a cell, that cell basically becomes on the clock. It's going to die at some point. It's just a matter of when, when we talk about different kinds of viruses. So let's go through the cycle process of how a virus is actually able to make more of itself when it doesn't have the capabilities of doing it on its own. Think about what it does have and we'll use that as a resource along the way. It does have genetic information, which means it does have the ability to instruct another cell to do what it needs it to do. It does have a pretty stable environment, so it's able to protect that genetic information just long enough to get from one cell to the next. And it does have these very specific receptor and marker proteins, and the receptor proteins especially are going to be what allows it to take over another cell. So the first basic step of this five-step process that we're going to call the lytic cycle is the virus has to actually find a cell that will let it in. So basically remember, receptor proteins send and receive chemical messages only when the two receptors match like a lock and key. So imagine a virus has a particular key and it's just going to move around trying its key out in all these different locks uh, until it finally finds one that works. That's pretty much how a virus works. It moves around within a given area and it's just going to bounce around from one cell to the other and every time it's going to try to match up its receptors to the receptor on the cell. Most of the cells will probably reject it and not allow it in because that's how your cells protect themselves with these receptors. But if a virus has developed a particular receptor protein that happens to match a particular cell perfectly, then that cell is going to be tricked. It's going to think that the virus is something that it would normally allow in and it will allow it in.
It's basically like somebody having a key to your house. If someone has a key to your house, they're going to be able to get in, and there's not much you're going to be able to do about it. So it's the same basic process. If a receptor protein matches, that virus will be able to enter in. So the first step is what we call attachment, and that attachment is what you're seeing happening at the very top of this lytic cycle diagram. Now this is a particular lytic cycle of a bacteriophage. You see the bacteriophage has its own unique shape and structure. We use this as the example. Usually most diagrams use bacteriophages as the example, but understand the same basic process happening with the circular shape of a virus, the kind that you would see in an influenza virus uh, and the other viruses that attack human bodies. So in this case, the first step is what we call attachment, where the receptor protein of the bacteriophage or the virus is able to perfectly match the receptor of the host. Once the two match, then the genetic information will actually be able to enter in. In this case, the bacteriophage sort of injects the genetic information, like a syringe, and the rest of the bacteriophage won't actually go in. For most viruses that attack us, like the influenza, the whole virus will actually be able to pass into the cell when the two receptors match up. And that second step is actually what we call entry. So whether it's just the genetic information being injected in, like a bacteriophage, or the whole virus is entering into the cell, that's the second step. Now one way or the other, the genetic information is inside of that cell. And to be able to take over the cell, it has to take its genetic information and mix it with the genetic information that's already there. This is a very similar process to recombinant DNA, if you can think back to that. The idea of taking genetic information from one and another and combining them together so that they all become one unified genetic line. The reason they're able to do this is because the viral genetic information is the same universal genetic code as all other living things, which is a huge evolutionary discussion and a connection to that concept that we've talked about before. Theoretically, they could have all originated somehow from a universal code, and the fact that they all have the same basic structure means they can all mix together. That's great when we think about other advancements in living organisms, not so great when we think about viruses, because now viruses can take their information of how to basically kill a cell and turn it into a, a virus factory and just mix it in with the other cells. Now, the way they do it separates the two categories of viruses. Viruses can either have DNA as their genetic information or they can have RNA as the genetic information. If it's DNA, then they're what we consider DNA viruses. Those viruses are pretty stable. Mutations do happen, but they happen relatively slowly because every single time a virus is able to get into a host, it's already in the form of DNA, the genetic information, so it's just a matter of mixing it in. It doesn't have to go through any kind of a process first. It can just mix it in. So the mutation rate is relatively low, uh, just like any other cell. So these types of viruses usually don't change very much over time, which is actually good news for us because that means we can figure out ways to protect over them over a long period of time. These DNA viruses are things like chickenpox and smallpox and uh, polio and different examples of things that we develop what are called vaccines for, which we'll talk about later. But these examples of DNA viruses don't have any sort of intermediate step. They just have their own genetic information already in DNA and they just match it up and mix it in with the DNA of the cell. And once that happens, then the cell will pretty much no longer do what it does if we're talking about this category of viruses. Now the second category of viruses are what we call RNA viruses. These viruses have RNA as their genetic information instead of DNA. And that causes some very specific changes in the instructions because once the genetic information gets in, even though it's universally similar, one is in the form of RNA and then the host is in the form of DNA. RNA can't just mix in with DNA and the cell won't just take that information by itself. What has to happen is that RNA has to first be converted to DNA and then the DNA can mix in. That process of going from RNA to DNA is called reverse transcription. See if that makes sense. You guys remember what transcription is, right? Going from DNA to messenger RNA. This is the opposite process. You're starting with RNA this time because we have a virus that only has RNA as its information and it converts RNA to DNA. So that process, imagine this. You have a single-stranded RNA molecule and you have to turn it into a double-stranded DNA molecule. That process is the opposite and you can imagine has a very high mutation rate because there's a whole lot more going on in order to try to turn all of that into DNA. You have to get rid of sugars, you have to switch them out, you have to change uracils to thymine, and you have to match all the corresponding bases. There's a whole lot going on there and there's a very high mutation rate that comes with that. 
That's a problem for us because that means an RNA virus has a very good chance of changing very, very often. And that means the genetic information changing leads to a lot of other things changing, which also means your body's defense system may not be able to recognize this new strain because of the mutations it just went through. So RNA viruses are the ones that we have a very hard time trying to protect against because every time we figure out a way to control it one time, it's a whole new story the second time around or like we've never seen it before. So an RNA virus has to go through this reverse transcription process. The process of reverse transcription uses a few particular enzymes that we've talked about before. Uh, particularly the most important one that I want you to remember is an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. So reverse transcriptase, as you can imagine, is the enzyme that allows for reverse transcription. So one way or the other, we have DNA that's the viral DNA ready to mix in with the host. Most viruses at this point will immediately take over the cell. They'll shut down all of the parts of the DNA, which means the only proteins being translated from DNA of that cell are proteins being translated from the viral part, which means now the only thing that cell is doing is making more parts of the virus. That's what we call the replication phase. That's step three. And then in step four, all of the different parts are going to be combined together uh, to make full mature new viruses. This is a process similar to a car factory. Uh, when you are thinking of productions of cars, they don't make a little Volkswagen and then give it some time and some food and then just expect it to turn into a monster truck, right? They're made in their mature form from the beginning. There is no growth or development, which is the same for a virus. So a virus does not grow and develop another characteristic of life. Instead, it's made and just assembled like a car. So this assembly process happens within a cell that's been taken over, what we call that host. So when the host cell is putting all the parts that have already been replicated together, we're now into step four, which is assembly. And now all of those fully functional and mature viruses are just waiting inside of that cell as more and more viruses are being made. And it's eventually going to get to the point, just like a balloon, if you keep filling a balloon up with water or a balloon up with air, eventually what's going to happen? It's going to pop, exactly, or lice. And the term lytic cycle comes from the process of step five. Step five of the lytic cycle is when the cell is so full, like a balloon, it's going to burst. And there's actually a few enzymes that the virus releases to help cause that breaking of the membrane so it can actually burst like that. Once that fifth step happens and the cell bursts, two things occur. One, the cell dies. As you know, one of the eight characteristics of life is maintaining a stable internal environment. And if you break a cell membrane and you no longer have that stable internal environment, the cell is no longer going to function. So when that fifth step happens, the lysing, the cell's done. The cell dies. And this is why viruses are so bad for you, because they kill the cells that they invade. So that's one thing. But the other thing is probably even scarier, is now that what started with maybe just one virus that was able to attach itself to the host, is now going to turn into tens of thousands of brand new viruses that all are completely identical to each other and are ready to go do the exact same thing to more cells. And if you also think about the fact that anywhere you typically have one cell in your body, you usually have millions of cells around them that are exactly the same to make the tissue, right? Then that means that every one of those thousands of viruses that just got released out into the area has the right key to invade a new host. And so you can see how quickly and how exponentially a viral infection can grow. It can start with just one virus and just after one cell we now have thousands of the exact same viruses that go and attack thousands of cells around them. And you keep doing this one round after the other. And you can see how very quickly the viral population can grow way out of control and can cause some very serious problems for the whole organism that's now having millions of its own cells destroyed through this process. So this is what we call the lytic cycle. This is how viruses are actually able to replicate. And all of this is with the help of the host because again a virus cannot do these things on its own because it's not living. So this is what your body's up against with all these different types of infections and uh, in the past hundreds of years ago we just depended on our own natural ability to be able to fight off the dis these diseases. And a lot of times people didn't have that natural ability. And that's where we've had all of these different plagues and, and famines and different categories of diseases. They've been because a wide range of people did not have the natural immunity to be able to protect themselves from these different types of pathogens, whether they're living or non-living. They couldn't protect themselves against them. 
And over time, recently, we've developed medical advances to allow for that. And we're back in point to our good man Fleming here. You guys remember us uh, discussing his discovery of penicillin. When he discovered penicillin in 1928, it was an absolute breakthrough. It was really considered the miracle drug all across the world. It was just being raved as the ability of protecting and, and defending you against just about any kind of infection. In reality, what these particular types of antibiotics, like penicillin, are able to do is help keep new bacteria from forming. And the way it's able to do that is by not allowing certain components of a bacterial cell wall to actually finish the process of forming its cell wall. So when bacteria replicate and make more of itself, if you're introducing an antibiotic, it actually keeps the cell walls of the bacteria from forming properly. And if you don't have a proper forming external wall or external barrier, just like at the end of the lytic cycle, a cell can't function if it, if it doesn't have a stable internal environment. So these antibiotics actually keep new bacteria from being produced properly, and that helps control the population. So antibiotics by itself don't actually kill off a bacterial infection. They don't actually cure you. What antibiotics actually are able to do is slow down the replication process of bacteria and keep a lot of the bacteria from making more of themselves. But you still have to worry about that current population, and that's where your immune system comes in to fight it off. So penicillin was this first bacterial control module, this first process that was actually able to keep your bacterial population from getting too out of control if we're talking about the pathogenic kind. And this is where the infections were really turning into very serious diseases and amputations and, uh, and death. And so it was raved by all parts of the world and every time anybody had any kind of an infection they just threw a whole bunch of penicillin on it and it just worked, worked miracles and it just did a great job. And everybody really thought that that was the end of bacterial infections for the rest of human existence. However, if you remember what we've talked about with natural selection, specific to antibiotics, they, just like any other population, when introduced with a very strong environmental pressure, very quickly started to recognize what the advantages were and what the disadvantages were. And they started adapting to that particular environment. Remember this diagram, I showed you this particular one um, in the last lecture of the previous unit. This is a perfect example of a directional selection. In this case, the different variety and the different variation in the traits is its own innate resistance level to a particular antibiotic. Let's use penicillin as the example. If you introduce penicillin to an initial population that's never seen it, the vast majority of those bacteria are not going to be able to replicate properly because of what penicillin can do. However, within that population, maybe there's one or two percent of the bacteria that naturally are able to block the function of penicillin and continue to form their cell walls properly. So those one or two percent are going to stay living and stay functioning even if there's a whole bunch of penicillin being brought into the, into the area. So even though the overall population is very well controlled and that person will be able to keep a healthy life, what they're keeping functioning and what they're allowing to continue growing is that newly resistant strain of bacteria. So now the next population is going to have a much higher proportion of those that are naturally resistant to it than the previous population. And the same thing is going to happen over and over again. And when year after year you're keeping introducing the exact same environmental pressure over and over and over, and they just fired out penicillin to everybody. Anytime anybody was sick, they just threw penicillin at them and said, don't worry about it, this will fix everything. You can see how over multiple generations of the exact same pressure, eventually the strains of bacteria are going to become almost completely resistant to this particular strain of penicillin. This is a perfect example of natural selection occurring. And so this happened, and, and we're to the point now where very few bacterial infections can actually be controlled by penicillin because of this overexposure of that particular antibiotic. So what did we as doctors and scientists do? Uh, we can't use penicillin anymore, so let's just make another one. So they made other antibiotics. They found other types of molds and other types of fungi that do a good job of controlling bacteria. And so they introduced that instead of the penicillin. Guess what happened? Miracle drug. We got a new miracle drug. It worked just as well as penicillin. Now this one is able to fight everything off that penicillin wasn't able to fight off. And it was great, again, for a few years. And this same process happened over and over again. You continue to introduce a new environmental pressure and keep that pressure consistent. Eventually the bacteria 
are going to only be the ones that are naturally resistant because all the other ones are dying off. And the same process happens over again. And now you have bacteria that are resistant to one strain of antibiotics or two types of antibiotics, or maybe three. And you keep adding to this resistance until you get to these what we consider superbugs. What you see down here is an example of MRSA. MRSA stands for Methicillin Resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Methicillin is an example of one of the super antibiotics that we have today. This antibiotic is one of the ones where we introduce if nothing else works. Because we as doctors have figured this out. Antibiotics don't work if we overexpose them to certain strains of bacteria. Eventually those bacteria become resistant to the antibiotic for this whole process of natural selection we've talked about before. So they've recognized this and rather than just keep adding and making new antibiotics in the same pattern over and over again, they have a few and a select reserve antibiotics that they rarely introduce. And these have become like the last resort antibiotics. These are antibiotics that they will only use if everything else fails. And one of those antibiotics is methicillin. Now this particular strain of Staphylococcus aureus is so resistant to every type of antibiotic because of our overexposure to it that it's now also resistant to methicillin, which again is one of the last resort antibiotics we have. So if someone does develop this particular type of staph infection, it becomes very dangerous. And there are multiple scenarios of people who maybe just have basic infections, no big deal, but because of an added infection that happens because of exposure to this specific strain of MRSA, what used to be just a small infection or a small cut is now a life-threatening pathogen. And this is all because of what we consider antibiotic resistance. So you would think that modern medicine has learned from its mistakes and you would think that doctors today would not prescribe antibiotics unless it was absolutely needed. But guess what? How many of you guys have had any kind of a virus and you've gone to the doctor because of that virus? Maybe you've had the flu lately or you've had any other category of virus and you've gone to the doctor for it. I know I have a little one. I have a son. And uh, over the first year or so, when we went to the doctor, it was, it was fairly common that he developed just a basic cold or a simple flu or just little kinds of viruses here and there. And every single time, our doctor prescribed him antibiotics. And I remember looking at that doctor every single time and wondering, why are you prescribing antibiotics for a viral infection? Because I understand what you need to understand, which is that viruses are not living. Antibiotics, by definition, just look at what the word means. Antibiotics are against living things. They attack and help control the population of living things because they have structural components that are similar to that of living things that are helped to be kept under control. So antibiotics work great against bacterial infections that have not developed a resistance to them. They do absolutely nothing for a virus. This is important you understand this. Antibiotics do not do anything to help protect viral infections. This is an example of an ad that was spread all throughout the hospitals and doctor's offices throughout the country by the Centers for Disease Control. This is the CDC, the, the one part of the country that's focused on protecting your body from disease. They sent this message out everywhere because they want this message clear as well. Antibiotics should not be overprescribed and should not be overexposed to particular categories of bacteria because if they are, they'll develop the same kinds of resistance and then those antibiotics will no longer be effective. Now the reason most doctors still prescribe antibiotics is because they fear that if your immune system is very busy fighting off a viral infection, then it may not be able to do much to control certain types of bacterial pathogens. And in that case, the antibiotics are there to help keep other infections from getting out of control while your immune system is busy fighting something else. It makes sense, and that's why doctors still do it. But you see the downside of this. There's a very negative consequence here. Now we have a situation where it's just as likely that our current antibiotics that are effective against our pathogens, our bacterial pathogens, will not be successful for much longer. So we have to think about a future here. What's our next steps? What are some things we can do uh, in modern medicine to try to reset this process or figure out ways to control these multiple resistance bacteria that are developing, these superbugs that are developing because of how we are exposing them to antibiotics.
I hope you're able to see a lot of the connections to your own everyday lives, and it's just going to keep happening for the next couple of units. So see you guys next time.